and action. What is art to you? What is art to me? What is an artist would be a better question because art can be anything. What is really art to me is the dedicated artist. I have no common denominator with religion or any rules because I believe rules are meant to be broken. Now come up with my own philosophy of religion. My philosophy of religion is poopooism. If I like it, it's ism, and if I don't like it, it's poo poo. Yari, what happened to your eyes? Well, I had a fight with my campuses. I've been in Bali. I've been in Bali now 15 years. Well, what led me to who I am today and what brought me on the journey was taking LSD at the age of 10 and going to Lovins against the Vietnam War. And being a child prostitute and meeting extremely famous people and having sex with them for money and them saying to me, why are you doing this? Why aren't you just painting? You're such a great artist. You're such a great singer and actor and dancer. Why aren't you being creative? And I said, well, it costs money to be creative. And so my prostitution gives me enough money to have an art studio, go to art school and do all the things. And you know what? I don't regret that. I went through emotional difficulties. Using the human eye and the human features in art is honoring God, honoring the soul of man. When I was told by Muslims that I grew up with, oh, you can't depict man in your paintings, it's against Islam, I would say, but it's not against Judaism, and I'm a good Jew, so I depict God in the way I see them, and humanity is God. It's the extension of everything that was created. So when I look at people's eyes, I get inspired, especially beautiful women, as I have been married five times and have seven kids. Why do I do body painting? Okay, first of all, it's one of the oldest forms of art on the planet. If you go back in history, it's the second form of art close to cave drawings. Body painting for war, body painting for marriage, uh, adornment, uh, all the great leaders of the world got body painted up to a certain century. It's a sculptural way of, ex of exchanging energy with a human being. This is it. This is really it. It's co-creative. If you don't have co-creativity today, you have nothing because the, the single artist just sits there in a studio alone, being very selfish and egotistical, doing his art. Which I love because art is beautiful, but the co-creativity brings all of it forward. It brings humanity together. Uh, I was born in Los Angeles in 1956. My father, uh, uh, graduating UCLA drama department, decided to take my mother and my three sisters and we moved to Israel. Israel was amazing. I've spent the first nine years of my life there. My dad was an actor, made the first films there. So it was the first touring theater production in the state of Israel. So part of your background is uh... Israeli, but you have another background as well. No, we were all born in America. My father was born in Palestine, 1922. My first nine years was creating theater, creating painting, but mostly I was a very ill child. I was very excited by my father. I wanted to be in the theater like my father, I wanted to dance and sing like my father. So I put on these little plays at the kindergarten. And then in primary school, I didn't like the system. I was a bit oblivious. I, I wasn't really taught about history as a child. I wasn't taught about anti-Semitism or anything like that. See, Israel allowed me a couple of different things because my family were founding fathers. I got an exhibition with Horace Richter at the top gallery in Jaffa when I was very young and he gave me my own gallery and my own studio. Of course he wanted to have sex with me, which I allowed him to. But I did have some very successful exhibitions between the age of 15 and 23 in Israel and Tel Aviv, which actually catapulted me for other art dealers to be interested in me as an artist. We left Israel when I was nine, and um, we went to California. In Los Angeles, back in the 60s during the Vietnam War, children under the age of 18 
were not allowed without a guardian past a certain hour in the evening. And being a rambunctious child and basically hitchhiking to the Sunset Strip uh, to avoid school, I went to the Strip when it's full array of people marched up and down the strip and everybody that you passed along the strip would say acid, hash, pot, quaaludes, uh, every, every name of every drug you can imagine. You could buy a head of acid for a couple dollars. And the police were there but they couldn't control it. There were thousands of people on the Sunset Strip every night and, and so there were a lot of vice cops and I ended up meeting Gaylord, my bodyguard there. He stayed my bodyguard for about 35 years and I got arrested um, eight, about, I think, 18 times. Uh, the first arrest was with a bunch of bikers called the Bounty Hunters, and they put me through the gas station window. And as I was coming out the front door of the gas station, there were about 20 cop cars in Van Nuys. At that point, the judge said, and it was sort of set up with the lawyers and the judge, they got me off the charges of everything as long as I would go back to Israel, go to military school. They sent me to this kibbutz where they made me work like a, like a pig. And I ran away from the kibbutz and I went to the mafia in Tel Aviv. And I disappeared for an entire year. That's where I met Grace Robbins and Harold Robbins and met my family in France and met my cousin in Germany. And they basically gave me money to paint. I had met Rod Stewart and Long John Baldry and a tour with them in the States before I got busted and went to Israel. So I went back to LA and they were on tour with the Small Faces and I said to Billy, I said I need a job. So at 16 and a half, I moved to London and became office junior for GM Records. Going to Geneva and meeting Charlie Chaplin and going back and forth from Israel to Spain, to Los Angeles, to New York, uh, working for Rod on tour. I was abused sexually several times by friends of Rod's. I was given uh, to Billy Gaff as a gift by David Forrest, who was a big agent. I wouldn't say really a pedophile like boys and girls, but he used me, and he gave me to Billy as a present, and Billy fell madly in love with me. I was getting paid way over what anybody should get paid for their job at the time, and having a lot of money at a young age made me extremely decadent. Think about it, I'm, I'm only like, at this point I'm 17, 18 years old, and Billy Gaff goes, listen, we need somebody to run the New York office. And I said, well, what does that mean? He goes, We're gonna, you're going to run 20th Century Publishing. My job was to run the publishing company and sign acts and sign films and sign intellectual property. Find things that will make money that are related to the music industry, film industry, and television. And I said, I want to be an artist. And he goes, well, just paint. So I took my money and I bought art supplies. And I had this massive apartment that had no art on the walls, horrible furniture, really disgusting. And I decorated it. I met Quanta Parker, the grandson of the great chief Quanta Parker. I met Alexander Radin. I met Michael Eastman. I met uh, Paul McCartney and his wife Linda. I went to the Hamptons. I put on exhibitions. But what happened was, is I got launched into the art world. All of a sudden, I'm meeting unbelievable people. It's the 70s. You've got Andy Warhol, you've got Frank Stella, you've got Michael Koenigan and all these amazing people. Even before London and everything else, I started making jackets and shirts, hand-painted leather on the Sunset Strip. My influences as a young artist were the Impressionists, of course, because my mother had paintings of all the Impressionists in our home. My grandfather, Moises, was a famous artist. The most important artist, of course, for me was Michelangelo. I, I, I went through all of his texts, all of his books. I, I was homeschooled, so I, I had a great library brought to the house. And then I went to Summerhill in England, and I went to uh, Haskell's Rascals in Los Angeles, and I went to LA Free School. It was open to paint every day. We could paint, we could do some music, and it was an unbelievable way to, to raise a child. The more childish I become as an artist, the more fun I, it, it is to be an artist. And the more I create with other people, the more interesting it becomes. Around the mid 80s, I developed and started a seminar called Art Release. And the Art Release seminar was basically based on the principle that if people get painted, they have a spiritual awakening. 
when they do art they have a spiritual awakening when they do dance and song so I incorporated dance song painting acting uh, body painting art release is a functional therapy for people it's it's incredible what happens to people's minds and bodies when they do a bit of breath work they do a bit of meditation they do a bit of art they change their diet Yari. You are really, really, not only as an artist, uh, but you are also uh, able to motivate others. For example, the body painting, what you're showing people to people, and also public. You are very special, you are genius and genuine. That's, I think, the impact you leave here in Ubud. These are the most important men in Bali right here. Ah. I mean, this is and also coming yeah, the, the Agungs uh -huh. and, and the people that make it possible for artists to live here like myself and <laughs> do exhibitions. Fantastic. It wasn't until later in my life that things happened to me by getting ill and uh, healing that I changed my mind about my relationship to God and now my relationship is very strong. I believe that things couldn't have not turned out the way they did unless I had prayed for them to, to turn out that way or meditated or visualized them turning that way. So yeah, I believe in God highly. I believe more in humanity needs to work much harder in its belief in themselves and God. I don't understand what's going on on the planet today, why people are killing each other from the same religions, uh, why people emphasize money more important than man, and why it becomes God. So my relationship to God is more spiritual. Uh, that's about all I can say on the subject. I've, I've built homes in lots of places. I, I worked with Billy to renovate, Billy Gaff, who was Rod's manager, to renovate um, places in London and also in Los Angeles. This is, this is Nyoman, the gardener. Without Nyoman, this garden doesn't stay alive. The roof, when you look at it from a distance from the rice fields, actually blends into the green. The, the house is an outdoor experience, so everything I've done is to bring the person into the space to relax in Bali and in beautiful, beautiful surroundings. I was always fascinated with landscape architecture. I, I believe that landscape architecture is, should be at least 50% of the budget of any home. I was very influenced by Nouveau in France when I was living in Paris, and I was very influenced by Deco, and I was also influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright, Buckminster Fuller. Uh, my mother built an earthship with a friend of hers in Northern California, and it was one of the first earthship homes in California. Be quiet, because I need silence. And I definitely need music, so maestro, please, uh, sh you know, let's put some music on. See John. When I'm doing black and white, really most of, the, most of the time I'm just not even thinking about it. I'm letting it happen to start. And then from there, I try to accomplish what I call a value as I go. And I'm more interested in what is value with line and creating value with line. So line drawings can be a few seconds to uh, three or four weeks depending on how detailed I get. So yes. There are no mistakes with black and white which is really the great thing. You can sort of keep going on and on. It gives me a sense of strength. I live my life I guess in some respects some people would say very selfishly because all I do is paint and do theater and dance and, and teach and I do the things I want to do. No one manipulates my time. I'm, in, I'm the master of my own destiny. I started out very naivist and then I tried to be the surrealist and I tried to be the Picasso-esque and I tried to be the impressionist and I tried to be all these different styles and then I realized as I was told by people, you're stuck. 
you know, and, and really important people in the arts. Uh, Alexander Raden said to me when he came to my home in the Hamptons, he said, Yari, you're stuck. And I said, why am I stuck? And he said, because you're much better than what you're doing. And you've got to get out of your own way as an artist, and you've got to free yourself up, and, and you've got to learn more about what you're doing. Digital art was a very interesting platform. Um, I worked with Paul Holman. And he did amazing effects, and then I met people like Rick Henderson, who was one of the writers of 3D Max. And all of them said, Yari, you've got to get a computer. And I said, what do you mean? I'm an artist. I paint. So the group of them bought me an Apple Cube computer, which was the most expensive computer on the market at the time. And they stuck me in my studio with this Israeli woman who taught me to use the Mac. And she put me under Photoshop and she said, don't measure anything just play with it like it's a canvas. And she taught me all the prompts and everything to use. And, and within a week, I was producing digital art. Within a month, I sold that digital art to BBs. I sold it to Top Ten Apparel. I, saw, I sold it to many companies in Los Angeles. And they gave me a lot of money to use the digital art on the clothing. And, and people like Guess Jeans and California Sunshine wanted my work. Everybody wanted my work. I was way ahead of the times and I was producing sublimation t-shirts. I had more new newspaper articles in Australia than most Australian artists ever get. W walked a naked girl down the pits of the Grand Prix in Melbourne, and she was completely naked, and we got her in there with a coat. And she caught onto the pits and took off the coat, and she was body painted from head to toe to look like a race car driver. And then I was the first artist to paint nude in Singapore, ever, yeah? I mean, you couldn't even hold hands in Singapore without getting in trouble in the streets. And they sanctioned me to do all nude body painting at Michael Ma's restaurant, Forbidden City, and nude. And I painted it in front of the press, in front of all of the MDA, all of the government people. Why did I get involved in massage and the healing arts and diet? Well, I had cancer when I was first starting my fashion business. And um, I went hot and heavy and there were a lot of people that died from the malathion poisoning in Lahaina. And my doctor said that I had about six months. And I met, fortunately through my mom, a woman named Shifra, which gave me the Ann Wigmore system, which we grass juice and natural. And I was able to survive the cancer, but it kept coming back and I got sick several times. And I wanted to know why. Um, so I started traveling a lot to places where there was a holistic community, let's say. What healed me, finally, was some Native American who said to me, why don't you come with me? And I said, why? And he says, because I can cure your cancer. And I said, okay. Um, I can't believe you because everybody else has tried and hasn't worked. I've been sick half my life, so why should I trust you? And he said, well, if it doesn't work, you don't have to pay me. And I said, how much is your fee? And he said, 500 bucks. And I thought, this guy's a real con artist. He just wants to make enough money to drink. Well, he took me to the reservation outside Santa Fe, and he made me eat heart meat from buffalo, raw. And I ate raw meat for 16 months. When I came back to UCLA to have tests done for my cancer, the cancer was gone. I married a, a Muslim. You know, I, I don't believe in secularism. Palestinian is as... Palestinians are wonderful people. There are many Palestinians that are not against Israel. I've been fighting prejudices all over the world. I've been fighting prejudice and small-mindedness all my life. I really fucking hope we wake up. I hope we really fucking wake up. Because if we don't wake up, all the money in the world is not gonna save us. So all these companies and countries that are talking about how much it's gonna cost to change global warming, and that it's, oh, and some people even say, oh, it's just a conspiracy theory to get more money from the taxpayer. Well, fuck it, we should pay 100% tax to stop these oil companies and stop these people. We should pay, spend all the money in the Federal Reserve because the future generations are inheriting the biggest mess this planet's ever seen because of the industrial age and greed. So fucking wake up.
That's it. I want to stop. On my tombstone, he was truly an inspiring spirit on this earth. <laughs> That's egotistical, but I like it. <laughs>